Hey everyone, it's Tremia. I know it has been such a long time, um, but I'm happy to be able to make this video today and to say hello and to try to catch up on what all I've been going through. As we all know, lupus, it comes in so many different shapes and forms and it just seems never ending. And once you think that no more could happen, that you've probably met the end of the line, <laughs> more comes up that you would have never even dreamed of. <clears throat> we all know that um, <clears throat> I had the this tumor along my spine and that was taken out. Well, during also that time frame, I start I was having really bad, I still do. Um, visual disturbances and you know my my lupus or I don't even want to claim it as mine but the lupus in me <laughs> it um, how it was finally diagnosed was because I was having optic neuritis and you know that was a good 12 13 years ago now and um, and with the optic neuritis, I was losing parts of my vision. I'd have great big black holes in my vision. And they treated that through plasmapheresis. And, you know, I had, a, I had bouts with it quite a few times. And, um, and the plasmapheresis always brought my vision back. Uh, I'm very, very blessed with that. And so, but then, you know, that kind of faded off and then, you know, new things started happening, you know, like the stomach issues, the lung issues, you know, just whatever lupus was deciding to do and, you know, blood issues. And then, you know, we, um, how my doctors put it, they didn't know what else they could do to help me survive. And so they sent me off to Chicago and we tried the stem cell transplant. Now, since the stem cell transplant, I've been fighting a lot of complications. You know, not exactly lupus itself um, being active and causing problems, but complications from, you know, medication, like from the prednisone with my vertebrae, compression fractures, you know, 15 of my vertebrae in my back are cemented. They, they're, they're full of cement to keep them up. I went from being 5'6 to 5 foot 3 and 3 quarters. Um, I used to could look at the peephole on my front door and now um, I can't. I can't even get up on my tiptoes because I'm so weak. Uh, I can't even get on my tiptoes to try to look out. Uh, so I've lost, you know, that's a great loss. And, you know, other complications, you know, like um, my immunoglobulins not coming back from the stem cell transplant. And we had hopes that they would come back within a year to 18 months. And now... Uh, my oncologist just said that we're just going to be seeing each other every three weeks <laughs> for the rest, for the rest of my life. And, but, you know, to get the IVIG infusions, because if it wasn't for those and for my oncologist here in Oklahoma City and him finding out that my immunoglobulins were not there, and that was just happenstance because he wasn't even my doctor and I just happened to be in the hospital and he saw my history of all these massive infections um, in ICU, you know, life-threatening. And uh, he tested for him, and he found him. And he just happened to be the doctor on the floor that week. And now he's my saving grace. Um, so, you know, just complication after complication also found out that during the stem cell transplant, um, well, afterwards, you know, you're out, you're supposed to get um, checked for your child. They check to see if you're still, um, 
about your childhood illnesses like chicken pox, measles, mumps, and that. And you're supposed to, it's not, it's supposed to show that you've never had them, that you've never had any, uh, immunizations against them because when you get a stem cell stem cell transplant they clear your whole body out you know you're starting over from zero you're a newborn baby um when mine was tested it showed that i had everything that i had had so they never knocked me down to zero so i didn't get the true benefit of that stem cell transplant um so that's kind of, you know, all of that for nothing kind of thought wants to go past my mind, but, you know, I try, I don't let it. Um, and then, you know, fast forward up to where we were with the, the tumor in my back. And then, you know, it made me think, you know, all of these medications that we're taking, all these biologicals, all these chemotherapeutic agents, um, you know, one of the adverse reactions um, is tumors can bring on cancer and all of that. So, you know, that thought come across my mind. Is it because of everything I've put through my system? you know, trying to get well. And so we got that taken care of and I was having the visual problems. Um, and these are weird visual problems. I I had the loss of vision like optic neuritis and, but I started having, I see three and four things in which we already know that. But also, I'll be sitting there and everything will turn upside down. Ceiling fan on the floor, the floor's the ceiling, the furniture's up there upside down. You know, it's things like that. Or then it started getting progressively worse. Like, there'd be three things and then one of them will start moving around. And, you know, I'll see things in movement that are not moving. Um, things will all turn yellow. You know, just really bad to where I sit with my eyes closed. And so I asked for an MRI of my brain, just thinking, you know, nothing's gonna happen. Tremia's never textbook for anything. And um, that actually was December 4th that they did that MRI. And then things kind of fell through the cracks. We didn't get notified, we didn't hear of anything. And then, um, Come January, we went in for a visit. Is end of January, so you know, two months later, and um, my doctor asked how the neurologist appointment went. It's like what neurologist appointment? Come to find out, the MRI shows a brain tumor, and it's a small. It's six millimeters by six millimeters. It's in the right occipital lobe, which is back here. And, um, oh, what else can I tell you about it? it um, and from the MRI, there it looks like it's a meningioma, which is a benign tumor. Um, so that was a complete outer shock. That's where I, you know, I thought after everything, before then I thought, man, you know, I've, everything's happened, you know, everything's happened. <laughs> Who knew that a brain tumor was going to come into the equation? And so we're in the middle of that. Um, I've been to the neuro-ophthalmologist and he said that, you know, the right occipital lobe, your visual cortex is there. And what you see through your eyes travels back to that spot in the brain. And it makes sense of everything. It puts everything together so you see it. And so, like, the tumor is interrupting my visual process. It's m not putting things together. It's putting them together in the wrong order. So I'm seeing things odd, vi you know, visual disturbances. And um, 
And I also have the loss of my left visual field in both of my eyes. So draw a circle, draw a line down the middle, in the left side of each circle on each eye, I can't see out of. So I'm only seeing out of the right part of each of my eyes. And that's why my whole left side is totally bruised. That's why I've got the house torn up, you know, running into everything with the wheelchairs and everything. So now we have the brain tumor. And the deal is, is it's small. It is causing all these problems. And um, the neurosurgeons at this point, uh, you know, the option is to get it taken out, which is a craniotomy. And I'm in no rush to have a craniotomy. No rush at all. Can hold off on that one. But, you know, it's small. So at this point, the deal we're gonna watch it see how it progresses if it um if it gets bigger and the symptoms are worse you know we'll see what happens then i have a very good friend she has the exact same tumor that's about three times the size of mine if not larger and she has no symptoms at all and you know and then they argue the fact of where mine is actually sitting, you know, could, you know, could it be causing this or not? But it is where the, the part of the brain that the visual cortex is in. It's not, they say it's not directly on the visual cortex, but I'm saying, in my mind, I'm wondering, how do you know exactly the pinpoint the exact place because they do these open brain surgeries all the time to map out a person's brain because they know the area that like okay walking is in this part of the area but exactly where is that so my argument is okay we know the visual cortex is in this area but exactly where is mine because I'm never cookie cutter so that is where we are today <laughs> and it's a lot going on and I've been having trouble with severe edema I mean in three day periods I'm putting on 14 pounds of water and I've done that twice so I have 28 pounds and then on another period I put on like six pounds and the Lasix and potassium is making me severely ill. Um, and we've had to go to the ER twice uh, to get IV Lasix because it was affecting my breathing. I was so short of breath. And, and it was difficult for the doctors. At one point, you know, there was no denying my legs were swollen. My hands were arms it, my belly I mean it wasn't just in my leg my hands and f no and it was not just in my ankles and my feet it was my whole body the back of my hands looked like they had tennis balls on them the top of my feet looked like they had great big sponges on them my legs um my calves were four inches larger than what they normally are my ankles also is just horrible but I'm down um, 13 pounds so I'm you know not halfway there yet and the doctor told me to take a rest from the Lasix because I'm truly truly sick and um, she had put me she sent me the cardiologist it was not um, heart failure um, they also ruled out uh, blood clots and so she said, I'm going to do this. And she put me on decreasing prednisone, 40 milligrams three times a day, 30 milligrams, not three times a day, 40 milligrams three days, 30 milligrams a day for three days, 20 milligrams. And she said, if that helps it go down, what we're dealing with is leaky vessel syndrome, and that comes with autoimmune. And well, it helped and the swelling started going down because I was taking 160 milligrams of Lasix a day and gaining a pound or two of water. 
And that's scary because it's like, you know, this is supposed to be making your lung, your not your lungs, make your kidneys, you know, go in overdrive. And I'm not going, I'm not voiding any more than actually less than what I was anyway. So I've been going through all of this and uh, right now my back is hurting. Uh, the pain pump is doing wonderful. It helps the pain, you know, spinal cord pain and um, pain, some pain down your legs. That's what the pain pump does. It doesn't do head to toe pain. Um, you might get lucky, you might not. Mine doesn't help the head to toe pain, just my pain in my, my back, a spinal cord. Um, so, you know, I still have to be treated for uh, joint pain. I'm having really, really excruciating joint pain. Um, believing it's RA, not osteoarthritis, but rheumatoid, because it's it's kind of like bone breaking pain. I can't even use my thumbs or my fingers. So, uh, they started me on a Rava and you know, that's helping, helping. So that's good. Um, my ANAs are coming back positive and, uh, we're, t I, I kept on, denying treatment um i just needed a rest you know needing a rest but now i'm getting to the point it's like i think i might need some help but i've been running a fever of 100.6 and so that's not considered a low-grade fever so even if i wanted to start something sim not simple but you know embryo or remicade or something like that I can't because of the fever and we can't locate where the infection is so she just put me on a broad spectrum antibiotic Bactrim I started it last night we're gonna see what it does for me um, you know uh, my mind's blank um, I have a really good doctor I have a really good team of doctors I'm really truly blessed and uh, because this is all difficult. I feel like now, all the years that I've been through, lupus has different chapters. It's, you know, it's a life story. There's different chapters in this book. And I feel like I've started on chapter three. You know, it's just like, it's a different chapter. It's different. It's different than what we've been through in the past. And, um, so, you know, that's my deep thought for the day, <laughs> probably for the month or year, um, but it's definitely, it's a different time, different things are happening, and, you know, I'm really sick, I can say that, I feel sick, so every day I get up, and it's like, I don't want to lay here and just be miserable, so I try to smile. And because smile makes things better, <laughs> just smiling. Um, like my nausea medicines aren't fighting off the nausea at this point. And my blood sugars are out of control. We can't get them under control. They're running three, four hundred, and I'm taking insulin, and it's not bringing it down. I see my endocrinologist on Monday. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening differently that we're not a u used to and, um, you know, don't have the knowledge of how to handle it at this point. Um, because you get used to things and you know how to handle it without even the doctor having to tell you how to do it. But these are all new things, new problems, new issues. Like I said, it's a different chapter. So, I'm going to go... <laughs> Um, my back is really hurting. It's the the nerves, the nerves, which isn't done by the pain pump. They have to do rhizotomies on my back, and those have worn off. So I'm going to go. I'm so happy to have been able to do this video. 
I'll talk to you guys hopefully very, very soon. Have a good day. See you in the next video.